So my Newsweek article of earlier today, the 31st of July, regarding Donald Trump's election postponement tweet of yesterday, July 30th, has been getting a lot of attention online and has caused a lot of debate, so I thought I would just briefly make some additional comments about the article, about the tweet, about the election. I think the first thing to underscore is that we have seen a lot of writing, understandably so and rightly so, about how Donald Trump can win the 2020 presidential election, what strategies he will use, what the circumstances in the country economically and with respect to COVID-19 would have to be for him to win, and so on. It's conventional political analysis in the run-up to an election. And honestly, what I've said online, what I've said offline, is that my own instinct is uh, until overwhelming evidence suggests to the contrary, and frankly, 10 to 15 point Joe Biden national leads are insufficient, um, both my heart and my head tell me that Donald Trump will find a way to win in November 2020, which is a horrifying prospect to me. But honestly, that's that's sort of where my head and my heart are at. But the conventional analysis that we see about the election, which I think is useful and you find it everywhere, focuses on, okay, how does he actually get to that result that Seth's head and heart and many Americans' heads and hearts are telling them is going to be the result um, on November 3rd or whenever we get the final results sometime in November because of all the mail-in ballots and probable delays in voting lines and so on. And the answer to that question, how can he win, is obviously multifaceted. One thing that he is doing, and I write about this in Proof of Corruption, which comes out in September, is there's a section in which I discuss the Republican Party's multi-million dollar systemic campaign to try to shut down mail-in balloting around the country wherever it can. On the assumption, and I think that there's, there's reason to believe that this is accurate, that universal mail-in balloting will aid Democrats in 2020. There was a Fox News poll that came out July 19th, which said that if the pandemic is still bad enough on November 3rd, 2020, for restaurants to be closed, Joe Biden's 10 to 15 point national polling advantage disappears almost completely and goes down to within the margin of error, which for that poll, I believe, was about 3%. Because those people who would have voted if the pandemic was only in a mild state, whatever that should happen to mean, on November 3rd, 2020, would be more likely to be Biden voters. And those who would vote no matter what, even risking a severe outbreak scenario on November 3rd, 2020, are disproportionately Trump voters. So clearly there's some reason to believe that the harder it is to vote, the better Trump will do. The polling supports that, uh, and that's polling, again, just taken within the last 11 days. So there is this systemic campaign to decimate mail-in balloting, uh, which of course is risable. It is absolutely gutting to our democracy. It's shocking to think that there's a political party in the United States that is committed to keeping people from voting. It suggests that that particular political party, in this case the Republican Party, believes that it can't win uh, in a fair fight of ideas with the Democratic Party. But let's, let's put aside that broader debate and just note that that's one strategy for Trump winning. Another is that he's installed a crony of his, um, Louis DeJoy, atop the United States Postal Service. And I have a whole thread on this on Twitter, and so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, this particular individual who's been put atop the United States Postal Service is mentioned in Proof of Corruption, and frankly, his background with Trump as a fundraiser, who his peers have been within the Republican Party as fundraisers, um, raises a lot of eyebrows about whether he is someone who can be trusted. He was appointed to his position within the Republican National Committee by Trump alongside Michael Cohen and Elliot Broidy. One of those two people has previously been convicted of a bribery offense and is currently under federal investigation for bribery, and the other one is currently in prison. 
So I have some real questions about what Trump's intent was in putting this man atop the USPS. And already just today, we saw a Washington Post article suggesting that what has been overseen by this Trump crony is a massive slowdown in USPS operations, which again, would impact mail-in balloting in a significant way that would benefit Trump. Um, Obviously, as I mentioned a moment ago, the more severe the pandemic is in November, the data is telling Trump the better he will do. And therefore, his, um, I want to say incompetence, but it's clearly beyond incompetence. It's malfeasance. It's deliberate incompetence. It's willful. Um, so therefore, beyond incompetence and beyond negligence. It's intentional malfeasance that has caused tens of thousands of deaths from COVID-19 and clearly put America in a position where we don't have this under control, we're not going to by Election Day 2020, and we have what is clearly by the hard data, the worst pandemic response on earth of any country. So that is also a political tactic in his favor, whether or not he's thinking of it in political terms. I think all the evidence we have from John Bolton's book and just being alive over the last four years, is that Donald Trump does nothing with anything but a political self-serving purpose. So you have to assume his COVID malfeasance, which again, I I realize I sound like I'm beating a dead horse here, but I, I go over these topics somewhat quickly just because I did write about this also at great length. Um, the longest chapter, in fact, in Proof of Corruption is about Donald Trump's pandemic response and the intentionality of it. So I'm just going to say here, that's another strategy for him to win. So you see all these uh, conventional analyses of why Donald Trump will win, what the circumstances would have to be for him to win. And I think people are accustomed to seeing that. What I created with my Newsweek article was something very different. It was a different type of analysis. And I think that that's what threw people for a loop. And I will say, understandably so. This isn't a typical sort of article because it's counterintuitive in many respects. And here's what I mean by that. My Newsweek article starts from the presumption, which frankly is a presumption that isn't where my heart is at and isn't where my head is at, that Donald Trump is going to lose big in November. So to be very clear, just to underscore this again, this is not uh, me speaking here as a Democrat sort of fantastically wishing for some scenario Um, offering you some sort of hope porn where I say Donald Trump is going to lose big in November. I I don't believe that, and I'm not actually submitting that. What I thought was important was for there to be political analysis that plays out a scenario in which Donald Trump is in fact going to lose by the double digits that he currently is losing nationally. And of course, while double digits nationally is where he's standing, he is behind in so many purple and even some red states right now and or within the margin of error that he could lose by a landslide, potentially, theoretically, in the Electoral College as well as a double digit national popular vote defeat. So I thought, given that that's a possibility, given that it's on the table, what would a piece of political analysis look like that plays out that scenario as of late October. And what I mean by that is, what does Donald Trump do if he gets to late October and the numbers look then the way they do now? It looks like to him in this hypothetical in late October, like he is going to lose by double digits, that he is going to get crushed in the electoral college with Joe Biden getting well over 300 electoral votes. And there are none of the indications, let's imagine in late October 2020, that Donald Trump and his team may have had inklings of in 2016, though really just inklings, because the stories that have come out underscore that Donald Trump thought he was going to lose up until the very end, as did almost everyone on his campaign. But let's imagine that he had some inkling that the numbers could turn around in 2016, and there's no sign of that inkling, certainly right now in July 2020. Let's imagine there's still no inkling in October 2020. I thought that someone should write an article which said, um, or at least imagined, what would Donald Trump do if he knew he were going to lose? Would he accept it gracefully? I think there's no evidence to suggest that that's the case. Would he go down quietly? I don't think there's anything to suggest that either. Would he accept um, the fact that he was headed to defeat? Interestingly, um, 
if the data in late October is what it is now, I think there is a historical argument to suggest that privately and internally, Donald Trump is capable of seeing when he is going to lose. Uh, he doesn't always reflect that in his public statements, but everything we've read, all of the books that have come out from those who were present with him in the room, literally, in November of 2016, have indicated that he really seemed pretty certain that he wasn't going to win, and he had come to terms with that. So I mention that just to say, what if we have this, this hard data staring him in the face in late October 2020, and he has come to terms with, I can't turn this around. These numbers are not going to change. I'm too deep in a hole. What decisions would he make in that situation? And so starting from that base, I, of course, wanted to imagine the most plausible scenario imaginable, again, in the context of Donald Trump always acting implausibly, insensibly, idiosyncratically, and in a historically reckless and lawless way. But what would be most plausible within that context? And I thought that the first thing to underscore would be, what can Donald Trump do that would be easy for him to do? It wouldn't take deployment of a lot of resources. It wouldn't take him having a lot of allies helping him do it. What is something he could do that would be simple for him to do? Because I do not consider him particularly intelligent or sophisticated. I think he tends to brute force his way through any problem he encounters using his very idiosyncratic pathology, which is, as you know, remarkably dangerous, sociopathic, narcissistic, and malignant. So what would be simple enough that he could figure it out, um, simple enough that he could execute it himself, and then also something that would be legal or legal enough or pseudo-legal so that he wouldn't face such immediate pushback from the institutions of which he's a part and which he contests with that it would make his attempt to do what I'm imagining he could do impossible. And so what that tends to leave you with is the following. What could Donald Trump do with a tweet? or a series of tweets in late October, if he knew he was going to lose, and if he knew that he needed to in some way assuage that loss by either damaging those who had caused him to lose, notably the Democrats, number two, by giving himself a narrative suggesting that he in fact had not lost at all, and then number three, trying to get something out of that loss, something of value, trying to salvage the election in some way. So what could he do with a series of tweets that would achieve that result? And then secondarily, because this is also his pattern, and it's something in writing three books on Donald Trump we saw again and again and again, and I saw again and again and again in my research, he always reaches out to his most trusted cronies the people who he knows will be with him no matter what he asks them to do. So what could he do with a series of tweets and also while reaching out to uh, one or two or three of his closest cronies? Again, simple plan, not sophisticated, easy to execute, fulfills those three requirements that he would have for anything he would plan to do in the 96 hours pre-election, and folds in a few of his most pliant uh, cronies whether they be aides, allies, agents, advisors, or associates. Those are the five categories I tend to think of um, that whenever Donald Trump is at the beginning of a scandal, he, he is reaching out to someone or multiple people in those categories. So when you put all of that together, you then come to a point, or at least I came to the point in writing this article, where I had just seen Mike Pompeo testifying before Congress under oath. And in response to a question, interestingly enough, by um, Tom Kane, the vice presidential candidate um, of Hillary Clinton, the question was essentially, what do you think about Donald Trump's election postponement tweet? And Mike Pompeo's stunning answer under oath before Congress in his testimony despite the fact that he's a lawyer and he was on Harvard Law Review and so on and so forth, and he knows that he's on camera, his answer was that Bill Barr will decide whether or not an election can be postponed. Now, as I underscore over and over and over again on my Twitter feed, in my Newsweek article, and probably will underscore many times in, in this brief audio, that is not accurate. 
only Congress can change an election day. So I don't mention Mike Pompeo's testimony as a way of giving it any credit. I don't mention it as a way of creating a, a boogeyman and suggesting that somehow maybe Trump will find a way to use Bill Barr to actually change the election day. Those are the sorts of scenarios that that candidly are put out there by not just people on the fringe, but but specifically people on the fringe who have no idea how the legal system works whatsoever and, and don't have any background in the law. If the law says right now, and it's not going to be amended prior to election day, that only Congress can change the election day, the fact that Mike Pompeo says Bill Barr will make the decision is not actually a statement by Mike Pompeo about what the state of the law could actually be, either now or in November. It is merely a statement about what gambits the Trump campaign could try to exploit to cause confusion, to try to exert their will on a situation in a way that would not be successful as a matter of law, but could be successful in political ways. And I'll say more in a moment in terms of what I mean about that. But listening to Mike Pompeo's testimony put me in mind of the fact that what better crony to turn to in this scenario than Bill Barr? Bill Barr wouldn't necessarily have been the first person that I would think of. There are many people who are, um, who have a long history. Roger Stone certainly comes to mind. Eric Prince comes to mind. Donald Trump's own family comes to mind. Steve Bannon and others come to mind as people who have been his political dirty tricksters since he's been in national politics over the last four years. So you would think of those people first and other others who are perhaps even further on the fringes of Trump world as being those who he might turn to as political cronies to help him if he believed he was about to lose the election and wanted to achieve one of the three goals that I mentioned a moment ago might be goals that he would have in deciding what to do about that incipient public humiliation. But Mike Pompeo made me think, well, what could Bill Barr do for Donald Trump? Well, what has Bill Barr done in the past? What Bill Barr has done is acquire for Donald Trump OLC, Office of Legal Counsel memos, that run afoul of everything we know about jurisprudence, the proper operation of law, law enforcement, the rule of law, our democracy. I mean, particularly when I was writing the chapter on the CIA whistleblower for proof of corruption, it was absolutely stunning the lengths to which Bob Barr, excuse me, William Barr was willing to go at DOJ to accommodate what he knew Donald Trump needed. So if Mike Pompeo, who clearly would have already had conversations as of the time of his testimony yesterday with Donald Trump about some of these topics, and there's no doubt that Donald Trump didn't mention for the very first time moving the election on Twitter. That's something he would have been ranting about based on everything we know about how he conducts himself and how he serves up Twitter content in his private conversations before it shows up on Twitter. He would have been speaking privately for some time about the possibility of moving the election. Um, Mike Pompeo would not be shocked to hear that Donald Trump had tweeted this. So for Mike Pompeo to immediately say Bill Barr is the one who would decide whether that's acceptable or not suggests to me, I'm not saying that I know this, but it doesn't suggest to me something that Mike Pompeo had put no thought into whatsoever when he was asked the question by Tim Kaine, simply because if you hadn't thought about that question at all and Tim Kaine simply said, look, can you confirm that Congress gets to make this decision? And you're Mike Pompeo and you're under oath, you'd just be like, yes, Congress gets to make that decision. Saying that, in fact, that decision is in the hands of Donald Trump's attorney general uh, under the circumstances of Donald Trump having almost certainly broached this subject with Mike Pompeo before suggests that Pompeo really wanted to make sure this decision was, at least in his own public rhetoric, kept in the sphere of Trump world, within the power of people in Trump world to decide. So my Newsweek article starts with the presumption that Donald Trump wants to fire off a series of tweets. He also wants to look at what his cronies can do for him and what can Bill Barr do for him. Bill Barr can provide him with a completely false, contrary to law, Office of Legal Counsel memo that says, yes, in the middle of a pandemic, when emergency powers in theory can for certain limited purposes, certainly not an election, be uh, raised by a president, and particularly also in the context of a postal service collapsing, 
Uh, can I imagine, can we imagine, can anyone imagine an Office of Legal Counsel memo under a Bill Barr DOJ that says Donald Trump can use his emergency powers to move an election? Sure, it's possible. Now, the article that I wrote actually doesn't depend on Donald Trump getting such an OLC memo. It simply lays out the possibility that that might be something Donald Trump would be able to get from Bill Barr if he wanted it. And I play out a little bit with respect to emergency powers, how Bill Barr might create the veneer of respectability surrounding such a decision, even if in fact any such OLC memo would be entirely lawless and clearly a, the act of a political operative, not an attorney general of the United States. But okay, imagine he either has in hand or does not this OLC memo. What can Donald Trump do to make a public loss that would be humiliating and extreme in the circumstances I'm imagining somehow okay? And the interesting thing is that I think all of us, including those who took some issue with the article, come to the same conclusion on this. I think every person I've seen online, uh, everyone I've talked to offline, Every article I have read in major media, blogs, elsewhere, everyone believes that Donald Trump would try to find some way to delegitimize the national election on November 3rd, 2020, if he knows he is going to lose, if he does not think he can take any action that will result in him being victorious. And so the question becomes, what's the simplest way for Donald Trump to delegitimize the election? I think all of us understand that for almost four years now, the easiest way for Donald Trump to do anything, in his own view, has been to tweet something. What can Donald Trump tweet that would delegitimize this election? And I ran through a whole host of various possibilities and hypotheticals. And clearly the most effective, the simplest, I mean, frankly, the most staggeringly effective, while also being almost the most staggeringly stupid thing that he could do, would be to tell his own voters not to show up, to say this is an illegitimate election. Because of the pandemic, because of the postal service, because of mail-in balloting, because of this, that, and a hundred other things he'll come up with between now, late July, and late October, he'll say this is simply an illegitimate election. I don't care if I lose because it's illegitimate. And therefore you my fellow Americans who are Trump cultists, not that he'll use that term, but I certainly will, you should take the same attitude that I do, that this election doesn't matter. And if I lose it, it doesn't matter. And if I get humiliated in the Electoral College and in the popular vote, it's not really a humiliation, because in fact, the whole election was a joke. And you voters, particularly my voters, should take the very same view of that. You should not go and vote as a way of sending a protest message. This is sort of along the lines of his Liberate Michigan, Liberate Virginia tweets, where he's essentially urging others to reckless actions that are, in many respects, in fact, in nearly all respects, contrary to their own interests, but somehow please a narrative that he wants to create and develop and disseminate. And this would be the best way to do that. Because, and this is where my Newsweek article ultimately takes this, what happens if, in fact, Donald Trump convinces large numbers of his voters simply not to vote? Does it, in fact, delegitimize the election? Now, there are many different ways to analyze that question. Does it delegitimize the election legally? I think almost certainly no, it does not. The election would have taken place, and everyone who's reading the article certainly points this out, and I agree with you. The election wouldn't have taken place. Joe Biden, in that scenario, would be the winner, and that's that. Do I think, and I want to be very clear that I'm sort of now playing devil's advocate as a lawyer, do I think that someone in Donald Trump's position could theoretically, if forced to do so, try to argue that there was some actual confusion over who had the power to move the election? and that he therefore, because of an OLC memo, made the statement that he did, that he had the power, and that that created a disagreement, 
a clash between branches of government, the legislative branch, Congress, which actually sets election day, and the executive branch, which has this OLC memo saying that Trump can change election day. Could you see a litigant to federal court saying that we have a clash between branches and that no matter how, and this is really the key point, no matter where the federal courts come down on this question, the mere fact that there is even rhetorically a question may have led to the disenfranchisement of voters who stayed home. And this is where things get a little bit more legal in character and constitutional, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds except to say this. The right to vote is considered a fundamental right in the United States. It's enshrined in our Constitution, in fact, more than any other right. It is considered ineluctable to uh, our Constitution. And therefore, it receives the absolute highest level of protection that you can get under constitutional law. It gets what's called strict scrutiny from the Supreme Court. Whenever a decision is going to be issued by, let's say, the legislative branch or the executive branch that could infringe upon someone's right to vote, that's going to get the highest level of constitutional scrutiny, the sort of coldest eye from the Supreme Court that any action by government can get. So imagine you have a large number of voters who say, look, I didn't go to vote because I was told that election day had been moved. You'll note that in that situation, those litigants wouldn't be saying it turned out to be true that a president can move the election. They wouldn't be saying that. It wouldn't even necessarily be the case that any part of their litigation would depend upon the Supreme Court saying that it was plausible that a president could move election day. They would simply say, I don't understand the law, I'm a voter, I'm a non-lawyer, and I saw the president on TV, or I heard him on the radio, or I heard him on Sean Handy's uh, podcast or radio show, or I saw it in a tweet that election day had been moved, and therefore I didn't go to vote. And there are millions of others like me, and we were disenfranchised. We were denied our right to vote. Now, people on social media are merciless on this point. Everyone I have seen says it doesn't matter if you choose not to vote, that's your fault. And you know what? All things being equal, that's 100% true. But imagine a scenario in which disinformation has been put into the jet stream of American culture, falsely saying that a president can move election day. Imagine that that president or that person who's spreading that information is the president, and imagine that that president has in hand a DOJ Department of Justice memo saying that what he says is true. Can a voter in that situation not go to vote and then later say that they were denied the right to vote by receiving information that they took in good faith and that they trusted that turned out to be wrong? Well, if it's just one voter, you're not going to have much of a chance of success, I would imagine, in the federal courts. But what if it's millions of voters? What if it's a class action lawsuit? What if a large number of people, quite clearly, based on turnout data, based on the final results of the 2020 election, what if large numbers of Republicans clearly did not turn out, even if it was the result of disinformation from the president, with or without an OLC memo? You could imagine a claim by voters that somehow the election was illegitimate because they had been disenfranchised as a result of their good faith trust in what turned out to be misinformation, probably from the Democratic side, we would say disinformation. So that's one thing to think about as a possible result if Donald Trump were to do what I described with these tweets, with or without an OLC memo, with or without, frankly, even a clear, unambiguous declaration of a moved election day from the president, which again, he has no authority to execute or even to make in the first instance, but just imagine him spreading that misinformation. So that's sort of the, the first consideration. Um, but that honestly is the, the moonshot scenario. No one is suggesting, and my articles don't really suggest at all, nor do what I say on Twitter on this subject, suggest that Donald Trump's goal would be to ensure that somehow we had a second election or that he stayed in office. Under none of these scenarios does Donald Trump stay in office after January 20th. And this is a moonshot effort to even arguably, through some congressional action, 
or some holding by what is clearly a hardline conservative Supreme Court granting him and the Republican Party, but more importantly, Republican voters, some sort of additional opportunity, whatever that would look like, to cast their ballot and to be franchised, to get the right to vote, which again is a fundamental right in the Constitution. That really is the, the moonshot scenario. More importantly, one of the things I focus on in my article is that Donald Trump, by delegitimizing the election simply by having his voters stay home, creates a situation in which the domino effect is staggering. And how many times have we seen a staggering effect on American democracy just from a sequence of tweets by Donald Trump? Whether it's him threatening witnesses, whether it's him issuing a declaration about Antifa being treated as a domestic ter terrorist organization, him pulling out of treaties, you know, his tweets can have substantial weight. And a tweet that tells his, or a series of tweets that tells his voters to stay home would have a gargantuan, outsized, historic effect on American politics, frankly, for the next 10 years. Why is that? Well, the first thing that would happen if he sent out a series of tweets, and if millions, doesn't even have to be tens of millions, it could just be millions of his voters listen to him and stay home, either as a knowing protest of democratic actions, allegedly, quote unquote, with respect to mail-in balloting, or because they in good faith believe that Donald Trump has somehow moved the election or has the power to do that, or should have the power to do that. If millions of people stay home, the result is that virtually every Republican aspirant to either stay in office or acquire office in November 2020 would lose their election. The Republicans would be wiped out in terms of the elections that are happening on November 3rd, 2020. Because, of course, there are down-ballot races. When people don't show up to vote for president, they're not showing up to vote for Senate or Congress or mayor or governor or any other election that's on the ballot in that particular year. So Republicans across the country would be decimated if Trump were to do this. Now, you might say, well, Trump would therefore never do it. He would never do anything to hurt the Republican Party. Well, first of all, I think all of us know that that's not true. That's not how he thinks. Secondly, I think we all understand he's not really a Republican. And third, many of us recall him openly threatening the Republican Party in 2016 primary debates in indicating that essentially if he didn't win the primary, he would run as a third party candidate, which was clearly a threat to destroy the Republicans' chances of winning the presidency in 2016 if he were not to be made their nominee. And that message was delivered loud and clear to the entire party. So no, it's certainly within his character and within his history to effectively take actions selfishly that destroy the chances of all Republican candidates nationwide to win on November 3rd, 2020. But imagine then the result of that. If you have all these Republicans who have just lost their elections, you have voters saying, well, that wasn't a valid election. That's why I didn't go vote. You have Donald Trump on social media all hours of the day after the election, November 4th, November 5th, November 6th, in television interviews on Fox News saying that wasn't a valid election. Can you imagine that some GOP office holders who had just lost their office or some GOP challengers who had just failed to win an election they thought they could have won would come out and say, you know what, I agree. I agree with the president. I agree with all these Republican voters. That was not a legitimate election. We need to have a do-over. Now, there is no provision in federal statute or in constitution or in any other document you could name or any other history in this country that you could point toward to say that there can even be a redo or a do-over or a re-election. There's no evidence that that's even a thing. But that wouldn't stop Republican voters from calling for it or GOP politicians for calling for it if they thought it would benefit them if they thought it would benefit Donald Trump, if even someone who lost by 30 points on November 3rd, 2020, thought they could get a second bite at the apple. So I think all of us can agree that in that scenario, you would have a clamor of voices in politics, in the White House, among the voter class saying, look what happened here. Joe Biden won by 50 points. Turnout was 25%. Millions and millions of Americans who are Republican didn't show up to vote. Many of us didn't show up to vote because we honestly thought the election had been moved. 
or we honestly thought that the election was invalid because of the information that we received, or there was no LC memo, whatever it might be, we've been disenfranchised, something has to be done. Now, what all of you reading the Newsweek article have pointed out is, well, it's certainly possible that they might say that, but it's also certainly possible that the Democratic Party might say, excuse my language, tough shit. You should have voted. Even if you had a good faith misunderstanding, even if you were misled, you should have voted. You didn't vote. The law says that the election was on November 3rd, 2020. So Joe Biden is going to take this victory, even though it looks a little bit like a statistical victory Saddam Hussein would have bragged about in terms of how much Joe Biden won by, even though, let's say, the electoral college vote is a little bit wonky because perhaps certain slates of electors were blocked by GOP secretaries of state who were protesting the election and refused to certify the election results to dovetail with Donald Trump's argument about an illegitimate election. Or perhaps it's a landslide electoral vote victory that's simply implausible in its dimensions, as well as not adding up to 539 uh, electoral votes. Um, Imagine that scenario. Imagine the scenario in which there are protests, mass protests among Republican voters in the streets, threats of violence, persistent claims that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president because, and this one small part would be true, the election results were not actually representative of where the American voting class was at on November 3rd, 2020. There had been this artificial intervention, uh, what we might call an interceding event, of Donald Trump sending out this misinformation or disinformation prior to the election. Again, we can all come to the same conclusion and say the Democrats might just say, big deal, um, who cares, doesn't matter. As long as Joe Biden has more electoral votes than Donald Trump, whether 270 or not, we can find a way to ensure that the popular vote of a Joe Biden 50 or 60 point win is honored um, when the Electoral College meets, even though there are complications with what happens if no one reaches 270 electoral votes. And again, we can all agree that Joe Biden might well take the Oval Office and certainly should legally take the Oval Office in that situation, barring any unforeseen SCOTUS decision saying that voters were disenfranchised. But what would be the odds of Joe Biden initiating a massive investigation of the Trump administration and prosecuting Donald Trump for his crimes while in office or his crimes before coming into office or investigating in a counterintelligence or criminal investigative way his ties with foreign countries, not just Russia, but Turkey, Israel, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, China, Azerbaijan, and so on. Venezuela, the entire list of countries where he had business dealings or political dealings that potentially could lead to criminal liability. What would be the chances that Donald Trump would actually face those prosecutions and investigations if Joe Biden had just taken the White House under the circumstances that I described? So now here we see a potential benefit to Donald Trump, again, in a scenario where he knew in advance he was going to lose as of late October, to so delegitimize and so burn the office of the presidency Um, through his series of tweets and possibly OLC memos, that Joe Biden comes into the Oval Office significantly weakened and unable to investigate and prosecute Donald Trump in the way that we know Donald Trump fears and should fear. Because the moment he leaves office at 12.01 p.m. on January 20th, 2021, he can and should be indicted at a minimum by the Southern District of New York in the Michael Cohen case, but he could face many other indictments, as could his associates. So that's a second benefit. There's the moonshot benefit of somehow getting a second bite at the apple. There's the clear benefit of being less likely to be investigated and prosecuted. And then the third benefit is a little bit more melodramatic, but also the most likely because it is psychological and quite simple, which is that if Donald Trump knows he's going to lose the election badly in a humiliating defeat days before the November 3rd, 2020 election, he will try to find a way to create an internal narrative 
As we know, Donald Trump creates his own reality and he lives in his own reality. That's why he is fundamentally not just a malignant narcissist, but a sociopath. He would try to create a reality in which he hadn't actually lost. Now, I say that that's melodramatic and psychological and intimate and actually quite simple, and it's just about his psychology, but of course it's not just about those things. Because if in fact Donald Trump has kept Joe Biden from investigating and prosecuting him, or I should say Joe Biden's new AG, whoever it is, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Eric Swalwell, I mean, whoever it might be who is AG uh, on January 20th, 2021 at 12.01 p.m., that person will be in a position to investigate and prosecute Donald Trump. But if they don't do that, it's not just that Donald Trump wants to be able to live in the repose of telling everyone, I didn't really lose. It's that Donald Trump actually has money wrapped up in the narrative that people accept or don't accept about the November election. He will be able to do more business deals. He will be able to create a bigger Trump TV network he will be able to maintain more of his political base to try to either run again in four years or pass down his political mantle to Ivanka or Donald Trump Jr. If he is able to spin the narrative that the election in which he quote-unquote lost didn't really happen to the extent that it wasn't actually legitimate. There is money at stake for Donald Trump in delegitimizing this election. There is psychology at stake for him in delegitimizing this election. And there is political capital, continued political capital, for himself and his children in him delegitimizing this election. So here's what I'll wrap up with. If you are reading conventional political analysis that is simply focusing on how does Donald Trump win, good. Keep reading that analysis, because Donald Trump is a very real threat to win this election, no matter what the polls are saying right now, and all of us need to be prepared for that possibility and take it seriously up until the moment the last vote is counted, whenever that is, in November 2020. But if you are reading the polling data, if you are, and particularly I'm referring to this Fox News poll that came out recently, but also the information in major media reporting about what Donald Trump is doing with the USPS and what the GOP is doing with its multi-million dollar effort to shut down mail-in balloting. If you are reading Donald Trump's tweets, which suggest increasing desperation at the possibility that he's going to lose and he's going to lose big, and if you've seen the polling, national polling and state polling that suggests there is reason to believe that he could lose big, and certainly if things are in November the way they are now, he will lose big. You should also be asking yourself, what is the alternative possibility? What does Donald Trump do if he's going to lose big? What I've laid out in Newsweek sounds in many respects fantastical and extraordinary and bizarre, which simply means it is in keeping with every other moment of Donald Trump's life and his presidency. If someone is spinning a narrative for you, a possible future scenario for Donald Trump's actions in the 96 hours before an election he is going to lose and believes he's going to lose in a humiliating defeat, that is a boring, anodyne, conventional response by a politician to an imminent defeat. You should be highly suspect of that narrative. Because it doesn't match the evidence, it doesn't match this man's history, it doesn't match his psychology, it doesn't match what all of us have lived through. Everyone in America should be asking the question, what is the most realistic way that this hyper-surrealistic and unusual man would react if he knew he was going to lose the election on November 3rd, 2020? I think that in my Newsweek article, I've played that out. And the fact that it has led to such an emotional response from so many people, both those who see this as a real possibility, what I've laid out, and those who find it farcical in some way. The reason it's exciting such strong emotion, I suspect, is that on some level we do all know that nothing is beneath Donald Trump. And in moments of desperation caused by Donald Trump, nothing is beneath the Republican Party. And therefore, nothing is beyond the capability of Donald Trump 
and the Republican Party to create as a series of political baseline scenarios and travails for this country post-election. I've laid out one scenario. There may be others. Again, I just urge you, do not accept any narrative that says things will proceed in a normal, peaceful, conventional, predictable fashion if Donald Trump is going to receive publicly the worst humiliation of his entire life. He does not have the psychological makeup that will allow him to not act in some wildly idiosyncratic way if faced with that eventuality. Thanks to everyone for listening, and I'm sure I will talk to you soon. Take care.